now that we learned about our senses and how important they are to us, what are the actual senses? That's what we'll talk about today. I grew up with the smell of the lake and the feeling of the woods. Steven Tyler. Wow, he's a poet, and he doesn't even know it. Today, we're going to continue our conversation and talk about senses. And now we're going to go through the individual senses from the book, Life in Five Senses by Gretchen Rubin. How exploring the senses got me out of my head and into the world. I mentioned last time I like Gretchen Rubin. Whatever reason she speaks to me about her experiences in the world, a lot of her books are more like personal research. Her trying to do the happiness project and make her life happier. Her talking about the four tendencies. Boy, that book described me to a T and my best friend. It helped us understand each other better. And it helped me understand how I motivate. Again, not scientific research, but her own research. And in this book too, she started out talking about how she was going to explore all the senses and try to understand them better and pay attention to them better. That's really the whole point of it. We start off first talking about sight. And like I said, sight is incredibly complicated. You don't see what you think you see, which is a very funny way to say it. I'm not going to get into the whole nerdiness of it, but essentially in our eyes, we have a retina. The lens of the eye focuses right into the retina and it's a photosensitive or a light sensitive area layer in the back of our eye. Think of it as the screen that you project onto, but it's photosensitive. And so then it, the light converts to electrical energy. It's upside down when it hits the back of our eyes and our brain right side ups it. And then the optic nerve will carry the signal to our brain. The brain processes signal into the image. And then we figure out what we see. We, we say, oh, I recognize my best friend or my house or my car. It helps us do that. And then by having two different eyes, each eye sees slightly differently. So then the brain puts it together. This gives us our ability to tell how far away something is. Maybe one eye gets a shadow while the other eye doesn't get a shadow. So it gives us some perception of the depth of the item or where the light is coming from. And it's really an intense process. It's even more different than that. It takes these images, the shadows, the highlights, the depth, the color, everything combines it into an image. But our brain also processes it. If we're particularly hungry and we see what looks like an apple on a table, we're more likely to recognize it as an apple, a real apple, when we are hungry than if we weren't hungry. And maybe we'd say, oh, that's just a fake apple we bought from the hobby store. Our brain also goes into processing the most likely answer to what we're seeing. And even if we're in dark conditions where information is sparse, if you're in a very bright situation, it's all whited out. And if you're in a very dark situation, the information is also sparse. The brain still tries to put things together. That's why sometimes you see creepy things in, in night. That's where the whole horror movie industry comes from. So our eyes can't quite adjust into it. So the brain goes, hmm, I think I see an animal up ahead. Nope, no animal up ahead. But your brain is trying to process it. We also have rods and cones. And rods are for that kind of night vision. They're very responsive in low light. They don't see color. It's all grayscale. Then the cones are for color vision. They require a little bit more light. That's why when you look in a dark closet, you're not seeing the full vividness of all the colors. They just have different abilities and skills, and they also are in different places. But the whole thing works again together to give us that full picture. It's really incredible that we see and we understand the world around us based on what we see. It's also one of the things when you start out in psychology research, you get to do perception studies, again, because you're not going to hurt anyone. So it's a very good starting out psychology researcher area. So I got a chance to do some experiments in perception. And getting back to the book, it, it shapes so much of what we're doing in the world. It lets us know there's a tiger outside our hut. It lets us know that our best friend just walked through the door or the dinner I was hoping to eat is sitting on the table. It's shaping what we see in, in, it enhances our lives. But even going to the place where we're going, she says, to planetariums, I go out and I look at aurora borealises. I mean, imagine that. 
The sun hits us with this gigantic blast of energy. It rips through the magnetic shield of the earth. And what we see is color and waves and sprites. And, and the whole experience is amazing. But that rich sense of what you see matters so much. The next part is hearing, and she talks about how silence itself can even be noisy if we pay attention to it. I love that image. I grew up in the North Woods. It was so quiet where I grew up that I could sit outside and I could hear the individual snowflakes hitting the ground. It makes like a little tinkle sound. You know, if you were just sort of tapping a, a tiny little xylophone, it was so pretty and I enjoyed it so much. I find one of the reasons I don't like living in a city very much at all is the noise. I just hear noise all the time, the traffic noise and people talking. And even when you go hiking in the woods and you go to state parks, oftentimes people are very loud. And sometimes now they're even bringing radios. It really just disturbs my whole brain. I didn't realize how important listening was to me. But essentially what happens is, is that we get these vibrations and then we have these pieces in our ear, which picks up on the vibration and then drums it out so that our brain then can process and decide what it type of sound it again it is. Our brain does a lot of processing of sound too. It can oftentimes strip out what is very familiar to us. Or you can imagine, like we're driving in a car, driving, driving, driving. We hear the motor going. We hear maybe the background radio going. And now we're hearing sirens our ears are going to pick up and say, uh-oh, sirens. So now we're focusing in on that particular sound. We're no longer hearing the radio, even though it's playing at the same level it was just a moment ago. And even if we're just driving, maybe we completely ignore the amount of noise coming from our car. I just bought a new car, and my new car is so much quieter than my old car. And I guess I didn't even realize it. Until I got into the new car, I'm like, wow, it is so quiet in here. And now when I drive my old car, because I have them both still, it's so loud in here, you know? So your brain has that ability to take something that's very familiar and cut it out of our sound waves. I think that's, too, a little bit why sometimes, you know, married people, long-time married people, sometimes they feel ignored because a person can focus on something and not hear their spouse talking because it becomes a familiar noise. And so you have to focus and say, no, 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 I want to listen to my spouse. I don't want to listen to what's on TV. One of them is going to get paid attention to, and you better do the spouse one because that's the important one. But sound has that ability too to help us understand the world. It also feeds into what our vision says. If we go and look outside and say, did I just see something? And then our ears pick up a rustling noise but it sounds big. Oh no, it looks like a bear out there. Or maybe it sounds little. Mm, that's probably just a raccoon, but they all work together. So sound and appreciating that is everything. She said that at one point she had to get an MRI and they asked, well, do you want some music? She goes, no, I just want to hear the machine. I had to get a CT scan the other day too. And it made me think, okay, let's just hear this. I watched it. I watched the machine spin up. I listened to the noise it was making. Boy, it really spins up on that last one. Or if we're just walking through the streets. I, I'm one of those people. I put in, you know, headphones and I listen to podcasts while I'm walking through streets of a city. I, again, used to travel for work. So I've been to New York and Los Angeles and Birmingham, Alabama and New Orleans. I've been all over the place. So many times I put headphones in my ear because it's noisy. And like I said, I don't like cities very much. But it is really interesting once I started focusing on the sounds, how the cities sound different. New York is very hustling and bustling and traffic and people walking to work and talking on the phone, business because, you know, they're lawyers and high impact people. Los Angeles, a lot of music, a lot of people goofing around, people skateboarding honking on the horn because the traffic's so bad. I could probably tell the difference now between Los Angeles and New York and audio. But she said that you don't have to just listen to the world around you. You can also create having the sounds in your house that you love to hear. She even talked about how 
the music in the kitchen. She started turning it off because she loved the sound of people cooking, slicing up carrots. Just the sound of what's going on around you can be great sounds too. She even talked about neighbors who have airplanes that fly a path over their house. They don't even hear it anymore. They've gotten used to it. So she's talking about how can I accumulate these sounds in my life, listen to the things I really want to listen, make it part of my habit, focus on listening to her husband. She said that she's never liked loud restaurants. I don't either. But that she said, I never, you know, tried to shape my experience based on the restaurant itself. Instead, sometimes they go to a restaurant and they're trying to talk with friends and they pick the restaurant based on who has the good food. But what about picking the restaurant that has the quiet ambiance so they can hear each other and so you can talk to each other? So now she's going to consider that as well. You know, that's funny because it's one of my first considerations. I've never understood bars, I guess. If you're going out with your friends and you want to talk about things, talk about the week, talk about the boy you just met, something like that. And now you go to this noisy bar and you're like, what? I can't hear you. The loud music. And then I found this one bar that was in town and it was just very quiet. It had music, but it had it in the background. And it still sold the same beer and drinks that people wanted to get. But instead, they could have conversations. That, I think, means everything to me. There's a fantastic breakfast restaurant in my town. The best food that you can possibly imagine. I never go there. It is so loud you can't have a conversation with the people you're with. There's a kind of a two-bit diner down the street from me. I will pick that place every time because it has the ambiance I'm looking for. So talk to my friend. Find out what's going on with him. She says in her own life, she's starting to realize she craves silence more often, that she feels sometimes talked out, and that she's okay with just having silence around her. And I'm starting to find that too, that I can go to places and just listen to the world around me. Not so much in the cities. I'm still getting over that. But even in my house, I have podcasts on at all times, or I'm recording podcasts all the time. You know what? I'm starting to get good at just sitting here in quiet and quiet and being at peace with my own thoughts. So she's trying to start her own experiment with just experiencing more of the sounds around her. Or if she's listening to music, not be something in the background to wash dishes to, but actually pay attention to it. Listen to laughter. Go to a coffee shop. You know, I ever do that. Go to a coffee shop and you can hear people turning the pages of their book, people pouring coffee into a cup. It's actually quite pleasant to be in a coffee shop. She doesn't necessarily want to create a specific experience all the time. She might at some times, but instead she wants to focus in, in the things going around her and then also maybe understand her musical knowledge better so that she can understand the music she's hearing too. The next sense is the sense of smell. And it's interesting how much things smell that we never notice. You know, we get the big perfume, the cup of coffee, the turkey dinner. A lot of things have very strong smells. We use it to determine if whether our food is still good or bad, whether we should eat it or not eat it. And sometimes we even use it to pick what kinds of foods we want to eat. Oh, is that cheese very sharp? There's some cheese out there that is just hideous smelling. And I don't eat it because I can tell by the smell. I'm not going to like it. People, too, talk about like smells like lavender. You always hear that if you have insomnia problems, lavender is a good thing to smell around you. They make these lavender packets you can just put in your pillow. That supposedly help you to sleep a little bit better. I have not tried that, but, you know, smell is all around us. And A lot of times, I don't think we don't notice it, the degree to which we notice our sight and our hearing. Think about it this way, too, that there was even famous stories about how when there are open houses for houses that are for sale and the people selling the house will come in and bake cookies in the oven. So the house smells like baked cookies, giving people that really ah, nice smell. It, it warms them up to the house. Maybe there is that cookie smell you want to have. Maybe you just want to have an absence of smell because it gives people the impression it's very clean inside. 
Someone even talked about brushing your teeth, that it is the perfect habit trap. You're brushing your teeth and you get this hit of minty taste and minty smell. And it's reinforcing, ah, now I'm clean, even though the scent and the taste are artificially added. But it's a feedback loop that says, you know what, my teeth are clean now. That sense of smell helps us to know what we think of things. She even went to a fragrance lab, and that sounded really interesting. He came out with the different smells and had them experience it, and even gave them advice about how you can enjoy smells better. He said that you shouldn't use coffee beans to clear your nose. I never thought about that because it has its own smell. Instead, he says, use the crook of your elbow and smell that because that's what you smell like. So it will clear your nose if you're trying to smell different perfumes, let's say, or you're trying to smell different wines to clear your nose. You have to be careful about layering too much or putting too many things together. Some Fragrances are very delicate, very small, and they're not meant to be overwhelming perfume. I always was that person who liked perfumes that just have a very small aura to them, you know, where you can get a whiff of it and say, oh, that person smells good. But some people lacquer perfume on. Then you give some suggestion, like fruity and citrus, not the same thing. I kind of figured that out. But how to appreciate scents different, but also mentioned that you, when you're trying to smell something, like I said, whether it's food, wine, perfume, each nostril is slightly different. And she said, you know, I got that idea that each eye sees differently and gives us that depth of perception. She had no idea that each nostril is a little bit different, a little different about how air gets sucked in and gives a little bit of a different experience. So use both sides of your nose when you're trying to smell something. That's pretty cool. And even suggest that while we sometimes go without catching on to scents, most animals use pheromones, some kind of a chemical compound that's invisible. Animals have more communication through these scents than we can recognize. We don't even tell the difference between them. But the animals understand pheromones and understand what's going on. Is my mate ready to have another baby? Is my baby looking to feed? Is my family scared? These are all animals, by the way. And they can tell by the sense exactly what's going on with their family. That's pretty cool. The next one she talks about is tasting. I realized that this goes so hand in hand with the sense of smell. I don't think in general I have a very good sense of smell, or at least I know that I tolerate bad smells better than the people around me. And I think it's maybe just because I don't focus on it, but I think it carries over into my eating as well. Like I said, I noticed when I got COVID just a few weeks ago, my sense of smell went away. And then all I could taste was bitter, salty, and cardboard, whatever the taste of cardboard is. They go together. And when we eat, it gives that experience through our nose and through our taste buds. But when our smell's gone, a lot of our tastes are too. But it's a rich experience with that combination of smell and taste buds and tells you whether you're having a great meal or not so great a meal. And I think, too, that that means I'm not as focused about how delicious something is. There are things I don't like, but once you get away from the things I don't like, I like most things and I'm not particularly picky about it. I don't really care whether I'm at some sort of a dive hamburger joint or a fancy hamburger joint. To me, hamburgers are hamburgers. She says you can analyze food because things taste fatty, she says, soapy, metallic, starchy. Those aren't real senses of taste, but they exist, she says. And the common ones are, of course, sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and umami. We've sort of generalized it into savoriness. And there are foods that have umami flavor. Generally think of umami as things like meat, shellfish, fish. Certain kinds of rich sauces, tomatoes, mushrooms. It's kind of a depth, you know, but like I said, it's sort of a meaty, savory, someone called it broth like, but that's the idea behind it. And so that's another type of uh, taste that we never really thought about. And each part of our tongue is responsible for a different part of our taste. So it's always worth kind of mixing things around in our mouth a little bit. But then there's that sweet foods. 
And we crave sweet. Some of it has to do with sugar, the energy provided. Historically, if you could come up with a pile of sugar, I mean, think about it for the entire history of mankind. We did not have enough food. And so the best people who survived were the people who were able to find foods and then people who were able to retain fat. So now we are the descendants of the best fat attaining people out there. But when you could find sugar that was high density calories and we get rewarded by it. So you think of fruit as being sweet most often. And you're like, yay, I got this huge source of energy. And so we crave it. Now, when we live in a world where we have all the food we need in most cases, it's not serving us as well. But, but having that sweetness is something that's just been built into our bodies. And then salty. I love salt more than anything. If you gave me a dessert or you gave me something salty, I'd pick salty almost every time. And it's important for us, too. We would die if we didn't have enough salt. It was used for preserving food. It was used for pur purifying things that may not have been pure. It also will reduce spiciness and bitterness. So if you ate something that is too hot for you, like a pepper that's too hot, you can eat a salty cracker and it'll dispense with that either high bitterness or high spiciness that you don't like. But it also adds to a lot of things. I've learned more so in my adulthood when adding salt to something that you would not expect to add salt to makes it so much better. And I've been trying lately, just out of health reasons, to eat less salt. And we have bitterness. Some people like the taste of bitter. I think there's even a gene that controls bitterness, and it has to do with asparagus in particular, other types of things. I don't like asparagus, and I don't like bitter tasting things. And I found out it is because I have the gene that tastes it too much. Sour? I do kind of like sour. And at one point, I used to eat sour candies. Those are my favorite things. That's another kind of taste we can get either with artificial foods like candy, but also think of apples. There are certain fruits out there that are awfully sour. I started baking pies with sour apples and then putting a sugar top on top of them. Really worked out pretty well. She says that a lot of genetic factors go into what we can taste and what we enjoy. Like I said, I have the gene for that bitterness, so some things are too bitter for me. And interestingly enough, when I was at a conference, someone brought super taster test strips. And so you would put it on your tongue and then describe how bitter it tasted to you. And you could tell by that whether or not you were a super taster or not a super taster. To me, it was pretty strong, but I didn't qualify in the super taster category. But it was strong enough, so I'm leaning more in that direction. You think about, too, when it comes to taste, how much that matters in our memories, almost as much as sight and sound and all the other senses. We think about mom's cookies, or we think about Thanksgiving meal or Christmas meal together. Or when we have a bad meal, we always talk about, oh, I remember we went to that restaurant and the food was so terrible. But she said that it would be good, you know, if you could keep some kind of a food diary. Like write down what are your memories of your tastes when you were a child. Write down college. What do you remember tasting in college? My friend Em, who writes a better life in small steps dot com blog, we used we were college roommates together and we'd wake up at one in the morning and put in the toaster, which we were not allowed to have, Pop-Tarts, strawberry Pop-Tarts. And then we'd sit there at one in the morning eating strawberry Pop-Tarts for no reason at all. And then we'd laugh and then go back to sleep. Or think about the pizzas you would order or the drinks you would get. Some people said that they remember getting sangria and tortilla chips. She said we could keep a journal and remembering those tastes that we have a little bit better. And she said because of some health concerns, she ended up having to reduce sugar and she was also putting on some weight and so now she learned that when she quit sugar she faced a lot of temptation for it but one thing i noticed because i too was coming up against high blood sugar so i started reducing the amount of sugar i had i started reducing the amount of salt i ate just you know out of general trying to be healthy you know what i taste it so much better now I can have a little bit of sugar and it tastes so potent to me now when it didn't before. I used to be able to just eat candy and not really taste how sweet something was. 
my friend would always say, you know, that's very sweet what you're drinking right there. And I'd be like, is it? Now I can tell. Very sweet. And when I lost my sense of smell during COVID, I realized how salty the food I was eating really is. And it now I'm doing more to get some of those things off of my diet. And the last one is touch. I think that one, too, is one we don't realize how, is imp- how important it is to us. But I noticed that when we did have the pandemic and they told us not to go over to each other's houses, that I started craving it. I never had that kind of craving before. You don't get a hug anymore. No one puts their hand on your shoulder or pats you on the back. And you realize, I think, more when it's lacking how much it was important to you at that time. But it's not just a matter of when you think of it, you think of touch, you think I'm going to feel this shirt and see if it's soft. I'm going to touch this animal at the zoo and see if he is soft. That's what we think about when it comes to the sense of touch. But instead, like I said, we don't think about it as someone putting their hand on our shoulder, someone giving us a hug, that kind of thing. Or even she said that when you're driving, the vibrations in the car, if you have a phone and it's sitting on a desk and it rumbles at you, there's also some ideas of sense of touch in there too. But she said that. This whole idea of getting more in touch with touch made her think about reaching out to people and touching them, giving them that sense of it so that they feel that you're there. She also then tried to put things around her that she loved to touch, talking about like what her couch was made of, what her chairs were made of, what her clothes were made of. Now, this is something I've always been sensitive to. I don't like rough shirts. And so I always try to get soft clothes. I will be more likely to buy a soft shirt that I don't really like what it says on it or I don't care what it says on it than a shirt I like that's not very fun to feel. So touch is very important to me. But I think we have to remember, even though it's a little bit understated. So she said that in this whole thing, she's decided that she's going to start focusing more on it. You know, even in her house, trying to make sure the smells are good, that what she's hearing are enriching her life, the church bells around her, the laughing of her family, the barking of the dog, seeing more, tasting more, everything, that she's going to immerse of it. And then she's even going to write it down that when I think of a person, she thinks of her husband, I think about how he smells. I think about what he looks like when he gets home from his work or how tired he looks when he's taking his nap on a Sunday on the couch. And then goes through all the senses. I love hearing his voice. I love how he smells when he drinks a whiskey. You know, so she brought that up. And so now, not only is she going to immerse herself in the senses more, but she's going to start, I think, journaling about it and writing them down. That she can have these little worksheets. And she said you can even go to her own website. She has GretchenRubin.com forward slash quiz. And there's general quizzes there. That she has the four tendencies, but she also has one on senses there as well. Write it down. Write down what you're sensing on a journal, what you smelled. That'll help you with your memories. It will help you indicate what you're paying attention to, what you're listening to, and the experiences you're having. You know, one of my favorite experiences was going out to the Redwood Forest out in Northern California. And the first thing that hit me was that amazing smell of redwoods. So it can have a huge impact on you if you just spend a moment and figure out what it is you noticed and what it is you experienced through your senses. So that's my challenge to you is to pick a day and just for one day, write down the various things you sensed in your house, in your car, at your work, at the store you went to. And how did you experience the world around you? Was your grocery store noisy? Was your car rumbly? Was the restaurant you ate at savory? Figure it out and write it down just for one day. You know, if you enjoy that kind of thing, you can keep doing it too. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember to subscribe, tell a friend, and email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. I'd love to hear from you. And remember, our path to understanding the world around us starts with senses and small steps. And we can hear those small steps too. 